what I'm going to do is I'm going to test for whether or not um, GDP in America is stationary around a linear trend. Okay. What I've got here is data for United States gross domestic product from 1929 through to 2015. So I've got a long series here of, um, uh, of um, uh, <coughs> uh, GDP figures. Okay, so um, if I do a quick plot of the series, give you a feel for what it looks like. Okay, I'm going to plot log GDP here. Okay, that's gross domestic product in the United States from 1929 through to 2015. Okay, now you can see there is clearly a trend in that series. So by definition, this is not a stationary series in the sense that its mean, its expected value is increasing over time. The question is really, how do we best model that growth? Can we model it by fitting a time trend to the series and then looking at the residuals around that as being a stationary series. Okay, so just before I go into the formal test for that, let me just show you what would happen if I did that. If I did a regression of the log of GDP on time, I could do it like this. I'd um, type least squares log GDP constant and then the built-in time trend function in EVUs is trend here. Okay, this is just fitting what we call a deterministic trend to the series. And basically what I've done is I've just assumed that it's growing at a constant rate through time and the slope coefficient here is capturing the average annual growth rate of GDP over that period. Okay, so a coefficient here of 0 0.035 is telling me that on average you, um, because I've put log GDP on the left hand side here, US uh, GDP grows on average at about 3.5% per annum over this period. Okay, so that's capturing the average growth rate. Okay, if I was to plot the series, okay, so look at the residuals and put a plot here, this is what um, I've effectively done. I've put a linear trend through the series of observations. You know, I've fitted um, a linear trend to the, uh, the data, and um, I, I've tried to capture that growth rate in the series through that trend. Now you can see that it's not doing too badly in the sense that um, there is this strong trend growth in the series, and I'm uh, capturing that reasonably well. Okay, it's fitting the data reasonably well there. However, if we look in a bit more detail and we look at the behaviour of the residuals, we should perhaps worry a little bit about this. Because if you see the blue line here, the blue line here are the residuals from this, the difference between the fitted value and the actual value. <coughs> and you see that over time we've got the negative residuals here, okay? Um, they quite negative for some period of time, they then become positive and they stay positive for a very long period of time. So if you think back to your um, uh, uh, econometrics from last term, this is likely to be an equation in which we've got a lot of serial correlation. Okay. Um, don't necessarily need to worry too much about that because um, uh, provided the residuals are stationary, then it's not necessarily a big issue. The question is whether or not those residuals are stationary around that linear trend. We want to test whether or not there is any tendency for GDP to return to a trend growth path if there's been a disturbance away from it. Okay? So that's essentially what we're doing when we run that Dickey-Fuller test and include a time trend in our equation. What we're doing is we're testing whether or not it's legitimate to model the trend in the series as a linear trend like this. Okay? So, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to run the Dickey-Fuller test for this. Okay? So I'm going to delete that equation there. And what I want to do is I want to test whether or not the um, series is stationary around that linear trend. So, I'm going to go to the command line here, and I'm going to type in the command uroot 
followed by the name of the series that I want to test. And I'm going to test log GDP here. Okay. And it comes up with a little dialog box here. And these are the various options that we can um, uh, we can employ here. Okay. Um, we want to test for a unit root in the level of the series. Okay. We don't want to do any prior difference in the series here. Um, we just want to test whether or not there's a unit root in the level. Um, in the test equation, it gives us the option of including an intercept, a trend in an intercept, or neither of those two things. Now, here, I am definitely wanting to test for a, um, a unit root including a time trend. So I'm going to move it down here to trend and intercept and click on OK. And it runs my test for me. OK. So let's see if we can just um, look in this a little bit more detail. OK. If I scroll down a bit, let me just look first of all at the equation that it's used to run the test. What it's done is it's regressed the change in log GDP on a constant, a time trend, the lagged GDP minus one, and then it's put in a first difference of the lag of, G, of log of GDP to sort of capture any residual autocorrelation. That's the equation that it estimates in order to construct the test. The test itself is based on the um, ratio of the coefficient estimate on lagged GDP, so that's minus 0 0.09, and divided by its standard error, 0 0.03 here, 32. That gives me a T statistic of minus 3.04. And if I was doing a T test, I would then quite happily reject the null hypothesis that that coefficient was zero in favour of the alternative that it was less than zero. Okay, so if I was doing a t-test at this stage, I would conclude that uh, gamma, the coefficient on lag GDP, was less than zero. Unfortunately, we can't do that here because under the null hypothesis, the series is not stationary. So the t-critical values are not the correct critical values to apply when the series is not stationary under the null. So instead, we need to use empirically determined critical values, or what we call Dickey Fuller critical values, and those are provided by eViews. So if I scroll up here, okay, you can see here that it's provided my test statistic for me. This is what it's extracted from the results here. It's minus 3.04 is my test statistic. It then uses the what it calls the McKinnon critical values. These are empirically or Monte Carlo determined critical values. And it gives you the critical values at the 1%, 5%, and 10% levels. Now, we most often use 5% critical values here. Um, so if we look at the 5% critical value, it's minus 3.46. The test statistic is less than that in absolute value. So using the correct critical values, we can't um, uh, reject the null under the, uh, uh, from this test equation. Okay, So we have to accept the null hypothesis here that gamma is equal to zero. In other words, this series is not stationary around a linear trend. Okay, Has anybody got any questions on that? No? Okay. So the question is then, well, what do we do about it? Um, if, we can't, uh, if we can't model it in this way, is there an alternative model that we can use? Okay, well, an alternative model might be to fit a, um, a random walk with drift. Okay, so what I could do instead is I could estimate an equation of the form... Um, least squares here, d log GDP, regress that on a constant, okay, uh, that would give, uh, give me a random walk with drift, because it allows for a constant growth rate. If I estimate that equation, okay, this equation is basically saying that on average <coughs> GDP changes every year or increases every year by a factor of 0 
Okay, and given that this is in the first difference of logarithms here, that's equivalent to an annual growth rate of about 3.18% per annum. Okay, not too far away from the annual growth rate we calculated before. Okay, you might say, well, it's not a particularly great equation, given that it's got an R squared of zero, but it's because it's got no independent variables on the right-hand side. Okay, it's purely regressing um, the change in GDP on a constant. So it's not surprising that it, uh, we get an R squared of zero. All we're really doing here is estimating a growth rate. We could go a search further, though, and we could actually try and um, start fitting ARIMA terms to this. Okay. So uh, we could see if there's anything that we can still explain here. So just going back to that, if we look at the Corellogram, the residuals, okay. If we look at the Corellogram of the residuals there, then you see that there is actually um, uh, probably still something to be explained here because the first order autocorrelation is actually quite high here, uh, 0.53. So. I would try probably fit in here a moving average process of order one if I was trying to explain it a little bit better. Okay, so if I go to estimate here, I'm just going to add an MA1 term here. Um, okay, hit return. Okay, and that actually does reasonably well. We get a significant moving average term there. The R squared has gone to 0.27, so we're starting to get an ARIMA model here. Okay, let me check the um, uh, results again. So look at the uh, residual diagnostics and look at the Corellogram. Okay, uh, there's possibly something going on at leg 4. You see the leg 4 autocorrelation is um, uh, significant. So I'm just going to modify my model once more and put in a MA4 term. Okay. Well, actually, if we look at that, the MA4 term has got a T-statistic of minus 1.64. It's not significant at the 5% level. So I'd be tempted to drop that and go back to my previous model, which I will do. Okay. So take that out. I would probably choose this model as my ARIMA model for GDP. Okay, so I've got here my ARIMA model for US GDP would be it's ARIMA 0, 1, 1. Okay, there are no autoregressive terms, it's difference once, and it's got one moving average term. Okay, so um, that's the, the basis of testing for um, the. Um, unit root in the C, uh, series when we've got a time trend okay what I'm going to do is work through another example of this and what I'm going to do is look at the relationship between imports and gross domestic product for the United States and this time what I've got is quarterly data from 1970 through to 2010 okay so let me first of all establish whether or not there is any possible case here for a co-integrating relationship between these series. So the first thing I'm going to do is just use the command show. I'm going to show log of M for imports and log of Y for GDP. Okay. There. Okay, that's my series. Okay. Now, if I take a look at those okay so we go to plot or graph here okay those are my two series that's probably not very informative because they're on a very different scale so what I'm going to do use an alternative here I'm going to plot them okay and then I can put them both on the, uh, I can use individual scales here. So if I go to options here, okay, uh, axes and scaling, put that on the right scale, okay. Well, you can see that these series definitely um, grow through time. It's probably the case that both of these series have um, unit roots, okay. Again, I'm not going to do the formal test for it. 
but you see that they do tend to move together roughly through time. For example, early on, you see that um, both imports and GDP reach peaks here and then decline, they then grow, and then again they reach a peak there and decline, but then gradually over time here, they seem to see the gap growing between them. So that's possibly um, a warning sign that there may not be a co-integrating relationship here. Okay? The question is, can we do a um, unit, um, uh, can we detect a co-integrating relationship or not? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the, I'm going to construct a, a unit root test by hand here. So I'm going to first of all run a straightforward linear regression of log of m on a constant and log of y. Oh, sorry. Log of y. Okay. So that would be a straightforward linear regression of log of imports on a constant and log of GDP. What I'm then going to do is generate a set of residuals from that equation. And I can do that using the following command. I can type series res equals resid. Okay, because it automatically stores the residuals under resid there. And then what I am going to do is I'm going to use those residuals to construct a unit root test. Well, first of all, let me just plot those residuals to take a quick look at what the series looks like. This is my series of residuals here, okay? Um, it doesn't look too promising from a unit root test because you see um, that um, uh, if you put the zero line through here, um, they don't particularly return to zero very, very quickly when they deviate from it. So I strongly suspect here again, we're not going to be able to reject the null hypothesis. However, let's try it and see, okay? So if I shut that window down, Okay, I'm now going to run a second regression here. Let me shut that down. And I'm going to regress d log res on a constant, res minus 1, and then I'm going to put in a lagged residual term here to capture any serial correlation. Sorry. I put in D log there, I'm so used to doing this, it's not D log, it's just the change in the residuals. Okay, so that would be my Dickey Fuller test equation. Okay, and actually um, the test statistic here, the T statistic is minus 3.64, that would be my test statistic here. Um, it's actually higher than the augmented Dickey Fuller critical values for a single series, but remember, these um, uh, critical values are likely to be higher than they were for the single variable. So again, it's quite unlikely that it would be um, uh, rejecting the null hypothesis. Now, so far, I've done it by hand, because what I wanted to do was show you the process by which you would construct the, um, uh, the test statistic. But actually, this is built into eViews for us. We don't need to do this by hand. If we want to do the unit root test here, what we could do is the following. First of all, let me just bring up the original series. Okay, so show log m and log y. Okay, so I want to test for a unit uh, for a co-integrating relationship between these two series. There's a built-in function in eViews which allows us to do that. And to access that, we would go to the View menu here, and then go to Cointegration Test, and use the option here, Single Equation Cointegration Test. So I'm going to click on that. You see the test method here is Engel Granger. Okay, so that's what we want to use. So I'm going to click on OK. Okay, and um, if we just bring that up to full size... Okay, this is the, uh, the model we've estimated. Okay, it doesn't actually give us the test equation here, but this is my test statistic. That's what I just calculated by hand previously. Okay, that's minus 3.64 was my test statistic. The p-value for that is um, 0 0.02. Now remember from your previous course, when we interpret p-values, 
if the p-value falls below a certain value, we say we reject the null hypothesis at that value. So in order to reject the null hypothesis at the 5% level, we have to have a p-value that's less than 0 0.05. Well, this is very definitely less than 0 0.05, and so what we're picking up here is, in fact, there is evidence here of a co-integrating relationship between these series. Because our test is able to reject the null hypothesis at the 5% level. Okay? So what we found is that for, G, uh, for the relationship between imports and GDP for the US, we've got evidence that there is a co-integrating relationship between these two series. Okay? Any questions on that? Okay? I must admit I'm surprised actually because it's the first time I've actually run that test on this particular data set and um, I fully expected not to be able to reject the null hypothesis. So the fact that I have rejected it has come of a little bit of a surprise to me. But quite a nice one because it's nice to have an example where we're not constantly um, saying that uh, we can't reject the null hypothesis. I should say as well, by the way, we can also uh, um, we can run the Engel-Granger test in either direction. So we can either make imports the left-hand side variable and GDP the right-hand side variable and um, run the regression that way, or we can reverse it and we can make GDP the left-hand side variable and imports the right-hand side variable. And what it's done here is it's given us that second definition here. This is the second uh, equation here where the dependent variable is log y. And in that case, the tau statistic is minus 3.45. But again, the p-value falls below 0 0.04, so uh, 5, it's 0 0.04 here. So we're again uh, picking up um, uh, uh, the evidence of a co-integrating relationship here. Okay, has anybody got any questions on that? Okay. I should say, by the way, um, I strongly suspect, you know, if you are doing projects in econometrics or you're doing um, research practice seminar in econometrics and you're using time series data, then co-integrating uh, relationships are something that you're very, very likely to be investigating. So I, I think that, you know, this is something that you do need to sort of have in your toolkit for use when it comes to your projects. Okay. Okay. And basically, I'm going to look at um, our GDP series. So, I'm going to test for whether or not there is a unit root in American GDP. So, again, let's just do a little bit of preliminary data investigation. So, if we plot the series. Okay, this is US GDP quarterly from 1970 through to 2010. Okay, there's clearly a strong trend in the series, so we're going to have to include a trend in it. I want to test whether or not this series is a stationary series. Okay, so if I do the Engel Granger test, okay, so I would look here, I would go to View, Unit Root Test. Okay, and we've got the augmented Dickey-Fuller test. This will give us, uh, sorry, this will give us the straightforward augmented Dickey-Fuller test, not the Engel-Granger test. Okay, I want the trend and intercept in there. Okay, according to the Engel-Granger test, um, if I test the null hypothesis that the series is not stationary against the um, alternative that it is stationary, I get a test statistic of minus 2.65. I compare that with a 5% critical value of minus 3.43, and I conclude that I can't reject the null hypothesis. Okay, there's not enough evidence here to see, say that this series is a stationary series. Okay, now let's go back to the unit root test here, and instead of the test, uh, the augmented Dickey-Fuller test, we go down to the KPSS test. Incidentally, you can see why I call it the KPSS test. It's the Kwiatkowski Phillips Schmidt Shin test, which by anybody's standards is a bit of a mouthful. So that's why I abbreviate it to the um, KPSS. So I'm going to click on that. Okay, I'm still going to include a trend and intercept here. Click on OK. Okay, and um, my test statistic here is 0 0.089. Okay. 
my 5% critical value is 0.146. Okay, so I would conclude here that again, I can't reject the null hypothesis. Okay, because my, uh, oh, sorry, yes, I. Uh, how do we interpret it? Okay, no, I can't reject the null hypothesis because my test statistic is less than the critical value here. Okay, so I would conclude here that uh, uh, in this case, if the null hypothesis is that the series is a stationary series, then I can't reject that null hypothesis. Okay. I'm sorry if this gives us contradictory results, but that is often the way with these things. And you often find that um, you know, it depends crucially on which way around you, um, uh, you define the null hypothesis. Okay? So if we define the null hypothesis that the series is stationary, we can't reject that null hypothesis. But if we define the null hypothesis that the series is not stationary, again, we can't reject that null hypothesis. So unfortunately, we're coming out with somewhat contradictory results here. Okay, 